and we should be live. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, it's uh, my great pleasure to welcome you to the um, 2021 edition of the European Association of Computer Science Logic Conference in Computer Science Logic, CSL 2001. And uh, it's also a great pleasure to welcome you, albeit virtually, uh, to Slovenia and to the Univers University of Ljubljana. Uh, when we were uh, originally planning the meeting um, a year or so ago, we were very much looking forward to welcoming, welcoming you in person to Slovenia and Ljubljana. Uh, unfortunately, the pandemic situation put an end to that. Um, the situation is what it is. Uh, so we have to live with a virtual meeting, um, but maybe virtual conferences do have some advantages. Uh, one is that they're easier to attend for um, people who would need to travel a long distance to come to the conference. And so perhaps for that reason, we've got quite a, a good registration number this year. Um, and then another reason is that because people aren't traveling, of course, virtual conferences do have advantages to the environment. So let us, uh, we have to have a virtual conference. Let us um, be thankful for the advantages and hopefully we've got a, a very nice conference to look forward to. Um, so this is for the local organizers, so the organizing team from the University of Ljubljana is myself, um, Andre Bauer and Danel Achman. And for all three of us, this is our first experience of organizing um, a virtual conference. In doing so, we've tried to convey a little bit, some of the flavor of Slovenia and Ljubljana. Um, one way you can find that is, uh, you can discover that in the social space where the, on Gather that um, you've all been sent a link to. Um, in the social space on Gather, there is a room that um, has links to uh, Slovenian culture and tourism videos. So please go join the social space and go and appreciate something of Slovenia and Ljubljana, and also please make use of the social space um, as much as possible during the conference, because the idea is that in addition to the social program, once the talks are finished, in the breaks, just as one usually would in a conference, please go and, and mingle in the conference environment, which is on the social space in Gather, and um, meet other participants. So one thing you can do in the social space is after the talks, you can, in the, in the break after the talks, you can go into the social space and there's a speaker's corner there where you should be able to, if you've got questions for the speakers on the talks in the previous session, you should be able to meet the speaker there and um, discuss their, their talks with them. Uh, the social space, in addition for being used during the breaks, it will also be used for the reception this evening. So please do come along to the reception um, which will once again be an opportunity to mingle and to meet with each other and where you will also be able to enjoy some food, drink and music from Slovenia, again, albeit virtually. Um, okay, so let me just check what else I'd like to say. So yes, so if you need assistance during the conference, if, if there's any matter that you'd like help from the organizers with, probably the safest method is to email us on the CSL 2001 email link. But another way is to bump into one of us on the social space. So there's myself, Andre and Danelle from the organizing committee. We also have um, four local participants on the help team. Um, they are Filip Koprivets, Anja Petkovic, Egbert Reicher and Katja Bercic. 
I realize uh, it's going to be hard to remember all that, but basically if on the social space you bump into someone with a Slovene name or with an Estonian name, then they are one of the help team. The Estonian person is Danelle. Um, so in addition to the social space, um, there's another event outside the social program, which is the European Association of Computer Science Logic membership meeting, which is tomorrow, Tuesday evening, local time. As you will have seen on the web page, all times are local time. So, um, so please remember to convert the times. Um, so everyone who is, who is registered for the conference is a member of the European Association for Computer Science Logic, and you are welcome to come to the membership meeting. So apart from that, the mainstay of the conference is, of course, the scientific program. I think we've got an excellent program ahead of us. Um, the program committee was chaired by um, Jean Goubo Lorec and Crystal Bayer, and I'm going to um, hand over to Crystal now to give you a few words of welcome from the program committee. So Crystal, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Yeah, a warm welcome also from, from our side. Uh, so together with Sean, I was uh, chairing the program committee of CSL. So altogether we have, I think, an exciting scientific program consisting of 34 presentations of submitted papers, five invited talks and two award sessions. Uh, so the selection of these 34 papers out of 82 submissions, this was indeed a very hard job uh, because the average quality of the papers was very, very high. Uh, so th that's certainly very good for the conference and a clear indication of its high reputation in our community. But on the downside, we had to reject multiple also very good papers. So in case you submit it and a, a paper has been rejected, then uh, don't be sad. This was simply a very, very tough competition. Uh, well, organizing uh, a conference is a very difficult and very hard job with many unexpected things happening during this long period where you start with the preparation. And it's in particular a very hard job uh, when it's a virtual conference. And in particular, if you don't know for a long time whether it will have some physical elements uh, or not. And I think Alex and his team did an excellent, amazing job to organize this. So special thanks to, to you, Alex, and your organization team. Uh, well, I would also like to thank uh, all the PC members, all the external reviewers, uh, so in the end, we had for each submitted paper, we had three or in some cases, even more reviews. Uh, this was a very hard job to do that. I would like to thank all the invited speakers to agree for giving a presentation. Uh, we would like to thank the ES EACSL board uh, and especially the chair, Thomas Schwentig. I, I saw him here, yeah. <laughs> uh, this was uh, great support during the PC uh, and uh, let's, let's say from the beginning and I think also for the for the organization of the event. Of course, also a conference uh, needs to thank all the authors of, of papers. Uh, and also we'd like to thank the LIPIX team. This was great support for, for generating the, the LIPIX proceedings. This was indeed uh, extremely simple. I did not expect this. This was the first experience for me. Uh, to, to generate LIPIX proceedings. This was a very, very smooth process. And last but not least, I would like to thank all the participants. Uh, so thank you for being here. Uh, yeah, so I, I look here, it is uh, almost uh, 10 past nine. So indeed, uh, I hand over again back to, to Alex, uh, now in, in his role for the chair for session one. Okay, so thank you very much, Crystal. Um, my clock has not quite gone to 10 past nine yet. It's almost there. But I think just to allow for people potentially just joining for the talk, those, those who um, wanted to avoid the administrative matters, um, let us just wait a couple of seconds and then I shall introduce the first speaker. So bear with me, please.
Okay, so um, so welcome everybody now to the uh, talks in the first session. Um, maybe the first speaker is, is someone who doesn't really need any introduction to, to this community. Um, so the, the first talk is by um, Samson Abramsky. So Samson, would you have you you should have the permission to share your screen now. Um, yeah, and to unmute yourself. Yeah. Shall I go to share screen? Yes, you should be able to. Okay. So we should have done this in that pause that I had earlier. Yeah. Uh, okay. So shall I go to? Uh, okay, if you can get to your first slide. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So to open the conference. Um, Starting at 11 minutes past nine, Samson Abramsky is going to um, talk to us about the logic of contextuality. So thank you, Samson. Okay, thanks very much, Alex. It's a pleasure to uh, participate in uh, uh, CSL 2021. Great pity not to have the opportunity to visit uh, Ljubljana, but uh, perhaps we can look forward to that in the future. So this is work on uh, the logic of contextuality joint work with Rui Suarez Barbosa. Um, so let me begin by saying a little bit about contextuality. I'm, I'm aware, obviously, that this is related to foundations of quantum mechanics applications to quantum computation. So it may be less familiar to some CSL participants. So I'll try and bring out the main ideas of uh, conceptual interest. So the key foundational question in quantum computation is to characterize those information processing tasks where there is actually quantum advantage, which is the point of building very expensive and difficult to build quantum computers. So things that can be done better using quantum resources than classical resources. So that as we pose that problem, it immediately focuses attention on what is non-classical about quantum theory. And in particular, it brings contextuality into the picture. So contextuality is a key signature of non-classicality in quantum mechanics. You may have heard of Bell's theorem, which exhibits the non-locality of quantum mechanics, which is actually a special case of contextuality. And from what we already know, it's highly implicated in many cases of quantum advantage. It may be the, the whole story. It's certainly a large part of the story. What is contextuality? Well, let me give you a sort of conceptual reading and we'll see a, a way of making it precise shortly. It arises where there's a family of data which is locally consistent, but globally inconsistent. So we're hovering on the edge of inconsistency or paradox in some sense. Now, the lens through which we'll look at this phenomenon in this talk is that of partial Boolean algebras, which were introduced by Cochin and Specker in their uh, seminal work from the 1960s, which really started off the whole discussion of contextuality. You may think that Boolean algebras are simple things, um, ignoring the sort of higher infinite, but uh, actually partial Boolean algebras are very subtle, as we'll see. So partial Boolean algebra is a, is, has, has a symmetric binary relation, which is read as commensurability or compatibility. Negation is a total operation, and the usual uh, and and or are partial operations with domain given by this compatibility relation. And the main idea is that if you have any set of pairwise commensurable elements, you can close it up to a larger set still of pairwise commensurable elements, which form a Boolean, uh, an ordinary Boolean algebra, total Boolean algebra under the restrictions of the given operations. And when I say Boolean algebra, I always mean total one. And the key example for quantum mechanics are the projectors on a Hilbert space. So if you just think of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, a projector is a complex matrix, which is idempotent and self-adjoint. 
And the point of view of Cochin and Specker is that we should only, when we look at projectors, their product, their composition is in general, not a projector again. The case when it is, is when they commute. So we should regard a, a product or composition as a partial operation and the compatibility relation in this case is just that the two projectors commute. So this seems like a very weak structure, but as we'll see, there's quite a lot to it. Morphisms of these uh, Boolean operations are maps preserving the commensurability relation and the operations wherever defined. So we get a category of partial Boolean algebras. Now, what did Cochin and Specker do? In their 1967 paper, often incidentally called, referred to as the Cochin Specker paradox, they showed that in quantum mechanics, once you go even uh, to dimension three and above, and you look at these partial Boolean algebras, P of H, that we were just mentioning, uh, then, um, then we find contextuality. So the way they defined it was uh, there's no, that this partiality is serious. This fact that we cannot take a global view of the data is serious in that we can't embed the partial Boolean algebra into a total Boolean algebra. And uh, what, they wanted, what they showed was that there's no embedding uh, um, of P of H into a total Boolean algebra when the dimension of H is at least three. Um, and in fact, they consider the hierarchy of increasingly weaker forms of non-contextuality and hence whose negations, what you can't do, become stronger and stronger statements of contextuality. So the weakest thing you might want to do is to have a homomorphism from your partial Boolean algebra to some Boolean, some total Boolean algebra. Uh, and this is easily seen if we re remember a little bit about Boolean algebras to say that, I mean, any ordinary Boolean algebra uh, with a caveat we'll shortly come to has a homomorphism into the two element Boolean algebra. That's just a, value, a truth valuation. Um, and the strongest contextuality property is that there's not even one homomorphism from the partial Boolean algebra into the two element Boolean algebra. And this is what they actually proved. And in particular, they proved it for the Boolean, partial Boolean algebra P of H when H has dimension at least three. And we'll call this the Coach and Specker property of a partial Boolean algebra. Now using this terminology, there's I think a, a, a conceptually remarkable result which, which they prove, which we can state in this form, that, that, that it's equivalent for A to be a partial Boolean algebra and for there to be a propositional contradiction something that could never be true under any assignment of values to its variables and an assignment to the variables of elements of the partial Boolean algebra, such that the partial Boolean algebra satisfies this formula, this contradiction actually makes it true. Um, so, and this of course applies to the event algebra P of H of quantum mechanics. It's saying it cannot be interpreted globally in a consistent fashion. So it's saying that our local observations, which are real observations of real measurements, cannot be, um, cannot be put together globally by reference to a single underlying objective reality. The various uh, sort of observations, what the observations we can make reveal are inherently contextual. They depend, if you like, on the, the Bo Boolean subalgebra we happen to be in. So we can, of course, ask, how can the world be this way? And the short answer is this is an ongoing debate and an enduring mystery, also something that we can possibly turn into quantum advantage, as I was mentioning. Now, in a paper a few years ago, Chris Hernan and Benno van der Berg showed that every partial Boolean algebra is the co-limit of its Boolean subalgebras. Co-limits are simple. We just take disjoint, uh, we, we essentially form a, a disjoint union, and the partiality makes this fine. We don't have to intermingle the two algebras. So it's very different to co-products in Boolean algebras. But co-equalizers and general co-limits are, are shown there to exist by an appeal to the adjoint functor theorem. And one of the things we did in the paper is to give an explicit construction of the needed co-limits. And I, since one of the referees seemed not to get this point, I refer you to a famous discussion by Peter Johnson, which we reference in the paper, of the advantages of an explicit construction, uh, which uh, turns out to be we can use in various ways throughout the paper. Uh, and in fact, the result we prove is this one, 
which is about extending the co-measurability relation in a given partial Boolean algebra. So given any partial Boolean algebra, any binary relation on it, then we can make things compatible according to that relation in a, in a universal way, in a free way. So here's a universal mapping property that said that. And as I say, we prove this in a, in a constructive way by giving a sort of proof system which generates the, the, the needed um, uh, partial Boolean algebra. We form terms and then we define three relations together in a single inductive definition, because it turns out to be quite subtle, the interplay between when things are defined, when they're compatible and when they're equal. So I won't try and parse this definition, but you find the details in the paper. And then one variation immediately is to add some equations as well as uh, some compatibility. And this we use this to give an explicit construction of co-equalizers and hence then together with co-products of co-limits in partial Boolean algebras. This is the basic tool that we use throughout the paper. Now, having told you this, that might seem, you might actually be a bit puzzled because Boolean algebras are a full subcategory of partial Boolean algebras. Uh, we know that, that uh, any partial Boolean algebra is a co-limit of its Boolean subalgebras. We can also take co-limits in the category of Boolean algebras. Uh, and hence, it seems there must be a map, a homomorphism from our partial Boolean algebra into this co-limit of the same diagram taken in the category of Boolean algebras. That just seems to follow from what we're saying. And in fact, it does. So how is that compatible with this assertion of the Koch and Specker property about there not being any such homomorphisms? So in fact, to resolve the contradiction, we have to do something that category theorists would do automatically, but most people working in Boolean algebra don't, which is to accept the one element Boolean algebra as a valid Boolean algebra. After all, it should be just an equational variety. So the one element Boolean algebra is the only Boolean algebra that does not have, pardon me, a homomorphism to the two element one. Um, and so what this is saying is that in the case of a partial Boolean algebra that has the Koch and Specker property, the co-limit of its diagram of Boolean algebras must be just this one element algebra. And in fact, we can make, uh, we can extract uh, a statement exactly like this. So in fact, this is saying that we can formulate the Koch and Specker property directly for diagrams of Boolean algebras without referring to partial Boolean algebras at all. We say that the diagram is Koch and Specker if its co-limit is one. And in some sense, the diagram is then implicitly contradictory. And in trying to combine all the information in a co-limit, we, we obtain the manifestly contradictory one element Boolean algebra. And the point about interesting partial Boolean algebra such as P of H is that they hold this implicitly contradictory information together in a single perfectly uh, consistent but necessarily partial or contextual structure. So that's a point to get from that. Now another fundamental construction is the tensor product which is how we put qubits together to get interesting quantum computations and so forth. If you take, I mean I mentioned dimension three as where non-classicality starts, there's a simple direct description of P of C2, the space of qubits. It's just a lot of copies of the four element Boolean algebra pasted together by co-product. And uh, one of the key points at which non-classicality emerges is by taking two qubits, taking the tensor product of C2 with itself. And by Koch and Specker, that, that is very already very different and highly non-classical. So we get a, a, a question, which would be really nice to answer. Can we put a monoidal structure on partial Boolean algebras, which captures the full logic of the tensor product? And I think a positive answer to this question would offer a, uh, would be a really useful part of the logical foundations of quantum theory. Alas, we don't solve this problem in this paper, but we are making progress towards it. And that's what um, I would uh, like to uh, I have five minutes, uh, Alex, is that right? I think. Uh, so that's yes. what I would like to uh, say a bit about. So there is a weak tensor product, which is dis uh, discussed by Hernan van der Berg, also by Simon Kochen, in fact, which again, we can describe using our extension of, in this case, the co-product by a simple relation that allows, that says that everything that happens in A is compatible with everything that happens in B. So this is a perfectly reasonable 
tensor product, uh, there's, there is a monoidal structure and there's a lax monoidal functor, which embeds the, um, um, which embeds the tensor product of these partial Boolean algebras of projectors into the projectors on the Hilbert space tensor product. Um, the thing is that this embedding is far from being subjective. And actually our favorite, I mean, the basic example we mentioned, the, the one qubit space C2 already shows us that uh, it can't be subjective because there are many two-valued homomorphisms on P of C2. After all, if it's the co-product of a lot of copies of the four element Boolean algebra, we can freely choose our truth assignment on each copy of four and then glue them all together with products. So we actually get lots and lots of two-valued homomorphisms. However, non-classicality emerges through the, uh, something that's going on in the tensor product, and that's no longer possible in P of C4. Cochin shows that nevertheless, this apparently small image uh, of what we get from H and K do generate the whole of P of H tensor K, which tells us that there must be additional relations which uh, holding which count for that. And really this paper is a quest to find those relations. So um, <clears throat> an important property which shows the subtlety of what's going on here is that um, um, it may be the case that some expression is well-defined even though various sub-expressions are not well-defined. This is part of the subtlety of these partial structures. So if we look at two tensor products of projectors, in general, we'd have to show if to, they, they commute to show that each factor commutes with the, with the corresponding factor in the other one. But to show that they're orthogonal, which then in turn implies that they commute, we only have to satisfy a disjunctive condition. We have to show that one of the factors, one of the, say the first factor of one is orthogonal to the first factor of the other. And then we can say that they're commensurable even though P and even though the second, the second components are not commensurable. So this subtlety is something that we have to try and capture. So the main sort of notion we introduce in this paper is this idea of logical exclusivity. So we say that two elements are logically exclusive if there's some piece of information which they disagree on. So they may not be commensurable, but one of them implies something and the other one implies its negation. Um, and um, so this doesn't mean that they have a well-defined uh, conjunction, which is zero, because they may not be compatible at all. And we say that a partial Boolean algebra uh, satisfies this principle if, well, uh, in the obvious sense. Um, let me just say that what we're able to show, again, using this general construction, this universal construction that we were, we were in introduced earlier, um, that we, we can show that um, we can form a reflection into this uh, category with the logical exclusivity property, which by the way, is satisfied by um, uh, all P of H's. So here's the formal statement of that universal property. Uh, so, we can, uh, so we can force this logical exclusivity property, which gets us closer towards what's going on in the, the, the real intended example of uh, Hilbert space projectors. And we do this again by ringing the changes on this inductive system, which it's a quite a flexible tool. Uh, we, we throw this extra condition into the uh, inductive definition. And we can use that to define a stronger tensor product, which gets us closer to the thing we're really after, which we would be a full logical characterization of Hilbert space tensor product by simply composing the weaker tensor product we had earlier with this reflection into this uh, logically exclusive subcategory. And this is still sound for the Hilbert space model. And we still get a lax monoidal structure with respect to this tensor product. So the sort of the, the punchline, I suppose, of the talk is uh, how close does it get us to the full Hilbert space tensor product? I'd love to be able to say it hits it on the head, but the answer is we're still not quite there. And it still remains something we're, we're sort of interested in, I think a very challenging, interesting problem. But we're able to show that if that we don't get this emergence of non-classicality. If A and B are not Koch and Specker, then this stronger tensor product is also not Koch and Specker. So it can't be capturing the full strength of the Hilbert space tensor product. And of course, the details are in the paper. 
if I have time, I have one more slide. So I just thought I'd, I'd show yes, you. Yes, you do have time. One more slide. You have time for one more slide, yes. Okay, okay. so I just want to, sh this is again a question which may intrigue some of you, which shows how different partial Boolean algebras uh, are to the usual case. It's a standard fact that every finitely generated Boolean algebra is finite. There are only, after all, finitely many conjunctive normal forms or disjunctive normal forms on a finite set of generators. But Conway and Cochin, yes, that Conway showed in 2002 um, that the following remarkable thing, again, in this P of C4, where all these phenomena already happen, there's a set of just five projectors, local Paulis that sit on one of the factors of the tensor product, which generate a uniformly dense infinite subalgebra of the full algebra. And they use some very elaborate geometry and algebra to show this. And I think it's a nice challenge for a, a community of logicians to, I mean, it's a combinatorial fact after all, is to ask, is there a logical proof? And can we use that to get a more general understanding of what's going on? Okay, I'll finish there. Thank you, Alex. Right, thank you very much, Samson. Um, so we have some time for questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, then either please raise your hand in the, uh, on, on Zoom, or you can ask the question in the chat, in which case I'll read it out. If, if you raise your hand, I shall unmute you so you can ask the question yourself. Um, Okay, so maybe while we're waiting to see if anyone would ask a question, I have uh, one question to, to get the ball rolling, um, which is, so could you, could you, Samson, say, uh, actually, in the meantime, Eric Gradle has raised his hand, so let me, let's actually have a question from uh, Eric Gradle, so I just need to um, ask Eric to unmute himself. So... Uh, Okay, so my question is, um, in, in the beginning of your talk, you said uh, that the real goal is to, uh, to prove quantum advantage. And uh, in, in what sense uh, are your results uh, really related to that? So the, how do they help to, uh, to establish uh, something that proves quantum supremacy? Uh, I prefer the term quantum advantage. Mm -hmm. um, well, the, the overall, the reason for being interested in contextuality, well, one reason for being interested in contextuality in general, apart from the fact that it raises very interesting questions about the nature of physical reality, is indeed to show quantum advantage. Um, this particular work is not directly aimed at showing quantum advantage. It's really aimed at understanding contextuality better. But to give an example, I mean, I, I um, we, there's... We, we can now know how to turn a class of contextuality arguments into shallow into quantum shallow circuits, uh, which uh, provably um, have provable advantage uh, ex uh, exceed uh, in, in what they can do any classical uh, shallow circuit of the same mm -hmm. kind. Um, so um, that would be an example of using contextuality as a tool to prove quantum advantage. That's not the topic of this talk. It's part of the general motivation. Mm, okay. okay, there's one more question from Joko Venon, which we'll take as the last question. So I'll just ask him to unmute himself. Oops. Uh, <clears throat> uh, is there a stone representation theorem for partial Boolean algebras? That's a great question, actually, or the, uh, uh, yes. Uh, so the, the answer is that, I mean, there's an obvious problem in the classical stone duality, stone representation builds a space out of the points of a Boolean algebra. And in some sense, the point of the most interesting partial Boolean algebras is that they have no points in the sense of two valued homomorphisms. However, we are working actually, and we think we're sort of, we should be, finishing up a uh, something which does generalize another related duality, the duality of complete atomic Boolean algebras. Um, and um, uh, so I think there is a duality there. 
Um, and the, so usually that's a duality with sets. And here it would be with graphs, the compatibility graphs, essentially. Um, and it's, it's actually quite subtle because the maps, well, it has a full duality, which includes the maps as well. Then the maps are somewhat, I mean, uh, it's not a trivial matter to find the right maps between the graphs, as it were. They're not just graph homomorphisms. Um, but yes, I, th I think the answer is yes, but we're, we're, we're still finishing up that work. But it's, a, it's a very good question. Okay, so th thank you very much, Samson. While Samson is um, stopping sharing his screen, let me take the opportunity to um, remind everyone that the idea is at the end of the session that you can meet the speakers in the Gather Social Space at Speaker's Corner. So hopefully that will be possible. I can't promise that any individual speaker will be there, but please um, let me encourage all speakers to try to be there at, at Speaker's Corner. Um, at the end of this, in the in the break after their session, just in case there are people from the audience that would like to talk to, to them. Anyway, so thank you very much, Samson, for the for that that talk. We now need to um, give co-host permissions to the next speaker, Moritz. Um, so Moritz, are you, are you there? Can you share your screen? Yes, I'm working on it. Um... Okay, so the next talk is um, by Moritz Lichter on joint work with Pascal Schweitzer. The title there hopefully is, is before your eyes. Um, so Morris, please go ahead at 9.36, you're starting. Um, so thanks for the introduction. This talk will be on canonization for bounded and dihedral color classes in choiceless polynomial time and is joint work with Pascal Schweitzer. Um, our paper belongs to the quest for a logic for P time. That is, we are searching for a logic. Um, those formulas precisely correspond to the polynomial time definable uh, properties. And one problem at so, so one problem at the heart of this question is a mismatch between Turing machines and logics. Yeah, so any reasonable logic is isomorphism invariant. So if you have a structure and your formula and the structure satisfies the formula, then every isomorphic structure will do that too. But now if you want to compute something uh, on a Turing machine, you first have to write the structure onto the band and thereby induce a linear order on the vertices of the structure just by the position of the band. And then the machine can exploit this. Yeah, I'm sure you all know some algorithm which somehow says take the first vertex, process it, and then take the next one. But is this what you can't do in a logic? And in fact, this, this artificial order is somehow what matters. Because if you take structures which are already ordered, so come in with a built-in order available to the logic, then due to the Immerman Vardy theorem, inflationary fixed point logic captures p-time on ordered structures. But we can also use this result to um, capture p-time on other classes of structures uh, using canonization. So assume you have a class of structures A, and in the logic of your choice, you manage to define canonization. That is, you take a structure of A and output an isomorphic structure, but now equipped with a total order. Then we can apply the result before, and IFP captures P time on this class of structures. Yeah, and indeed, this was the, the approach of choice for several results. If we consider again a quest for logic for p-time, we don't have too many uh, candidates of such a logics. And one is choiceless polynomial time introduced by Blas, Gurevich, and Schilach. And this logic is for manipulating Harrod Kelly finite sets. So you start with the finite universe of your structure, and then you can build sets of sets of sets and so forth. You have all operations on sets you know available. The only thing which you cannot do is you pick an arbitrary element out of a set. So if you want to process an element of a set, you have to process all of them. And this is, that is what makes this logic choiceless and in particular isomorphism invariant. Then we have to add a fixed point operator to have recursion. And because for example, by taking power sets, you can easily construct exponentially sized objects. We have to annotate formulas with explicit polynomial bounds. 
So once we exceed this polynomial, the formula is just false. And now we want to use uh, choice this polynomial time or CPT for short for canonization. So, and before I actually want to, to investigate what we can do in CPT, let's look at general canonization algorithms uh, first. And one breakthrough in these algorithms was the use of group theoretic techniques, for example, for graphs of bounded degree due to Lux. And these group theoretic techniques, they all rely on choosing generating sets for the groups you're computing with. But now there are groups uh, which have exponentially many generating sets. So we cannot really hope to do something like this in a logic because we somehow have to get one of these sets and cannot do it for all. So what, what would be nice to have in logics? First reasonable goal is if we could manage to canonize a structure of this bounded color class size. What is this here on the right? You have a bunch of vertices which are colored. Um, a set of vertices with the same color is called a color class. Now we want that there is a total order on the colors or a total pre-order on the vertices. If we now restrict the size of such a color class by a constant, to be of a constant, yeah, then we are not too far away from a total order anymore, but we still don't know how to do that in logic. Why is this a, a reasonable first goal? Because from an algorithmic perspective, in that case, we need, uh, we need a kind of the most easiest group theory. Okay, if we put more restrictions on the color classes, if we want them to be already uh, also abelian, then this can be canonized in choice as polynomial time due to Abu Zaid, Gredel, Kohr, and Pakusa. What does it mean for a color class to abelian? That is, if we look at the induced substructure of one color class, then this should have an abelian automorphism group. How could this look like in our example? Um, if we draw in a directed cycle in each color class, now every the automorphism group of every color class is the cyclic group of order five here, and in particular abelian. And we have no restriction for the connections between the color classes. So we can have edges wherever we like, or because we are working with structures, we can also have relations of higher RET. So the abelian case is somehow done. And what we want to do, or what we did in our paper is we were considering somehow the easiest non-abelian groups, uh, which we are regarding as jahedra groups. So what would, what would this be in our example? Yeah, so we've just made the cycles undirected. We, uh, we have here regular n-gons in each color class and dihedral groups are uh, indeed the automorphism groups of regular n-gons. So the main theorem of our paper is that we show that structure of this bounded color class size um, can be canonized in choices polynomial time if we have dihedral graphs, so relations of RET2 or odd dihedral ternary structures. What I mean with odd dihedral is if all these uh, undirected cycles are actually drawn in an odd number of vertices. So the example on the right is actually odd dihedral. So how do we prove this theorem? We begin with uh, proposing a normal form for structures. And it consists of two kinds of color classes. So in this picture, every cycle is a color class and every connection between two uh, color classes stands for some edges between vertices of them. Yeah, in, this, in this picture, I want to call the uh, color classes above group color classes and the ones at the bottom extension color classes. You see that these group color classes form such triples and each group color class is connected to exactly one extension color class and there are no connection between the extension color classes. Yeah, so far this would be relatively easy to achieve, but we want more properties. If you look at such a triple, we want that their automorphism group as the, the, the automorphism of the induced substructure of such a triple is a two injective three factor subdirect product. Yeah, in this talk, we will just use them as black box uh, and call them injective products. For these vertical connections, we want that these are quotients. So the group color class in such a relation has an automorphism group, and this should be a quotient of the automorphism group of the adjacent extension color class. Then we show that if we start with a structure of bounded color class size of RT3, then we can reduce this canonization preservingly in choices polynomial time to this normal form. And with canonization preservingly here, I mean that if we manage to canonize the normal form, then we can also canonize the structure we've started with. 
okay, due to this uh, reduction, um, the class of automorphism groups, we have to consider some more changes. So we not, not only have to consider dihedral groups, but also cyclic groups. And now let's investigate these injective products and how they can look like if we know that we are uh, working with dihedral groups. Therefore, I first want to introduce the, no the notion of a rotate over flat group. So consider the direct product of three dihedral groups and then take some uh, subgroup gamma of this product. Yeah, now every element in gamma consists of one element of each factor. And I want to call such an element a rotation if it's a rotation in all factors. So here you have the rotation by one in the left, by two in the middle and by one, but in the other direction on the right. Likewise, I want to call an element a reflection if it's a reflection in all three factors. And these reflections are what make the, make the hydro groups non-abelian. Yeah, if you just take rotations, you have cyclic groups, which are abelian, and with these reflections, it becomes non-abelian. And now gamma is called a rotate or reflect group if it only contains of such reflections or rotations. Yeah, because in, in the direct product, you have, of course, also mixed elements. But we don't want to have them present in gamma. And now let's use this rotate or reflect groups to classify uh, injective products. So let gamma be an injective product, either of three dihedral groups, or as I told, we also have to, to take, uh, take care of our cyclic groups, of one cyclic group and two dihedral group. Then we have exactly one of the following, either gamma or its projection to the two dihedral groups is a rotate or reflect group, or gamma is the isomorphic to the double CFI group, some exceptional case, or lastly, gamma is already abelian. Now, if you ask what is, this, what is in the case for two cyclic groups and one dihedral group, yeah, then I tell you that there are no such injective products. Okay, now what is this uh, exceptional case here? Um, for this talk, it doesn't matter because uh, I will forbid it and we will only consider double CFI free structures, which are such structures in the mentioned normal form with dihedral or cyclic color classes where the double CFI group does not occur. While this now seems like to be an artificial uh, 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 class of structures, um, it actually contains the two ones I mentioned in the beginning, which are dihedral graphs and odd dihedral ternary structures. And now let's um, exploit this classification and look what we can do in, in our structures of it. So this is the structure in the normal form we have seen. Now a color class becomes um, a regular six gon if its automorphism group is a dihedral group and a directed um, regular six gon if it's a cyclic group. And now let's look at this injective products here. So this one here consists of three cyclic groups. So in particular, the, the product also has to be abelian. This one here consists of three dihedral groups and by other classification, the injective product has to be a rotate or a flat group. Yeah, for the third one, we know that the projection on the two uh, dihedral uh, factors is a rotate and reflect group, and likewise for the fourth. Now assume we somehow manage to give one color class an orientation here. Yeah, so we withdraw in a direction into the cycle. Then, because this is a rotate or reflect group, and now because the left factor is now uh, oriented, and we forbid all reflection in, in, in this um, rotate or reflect group. That is, we can actually give the other two factors an orientation to. And this step is canonical. So given the orientation of the first color class, we can define the two orientations of the other ones in choiceless polynomial time. This approach also travels through uh, this quotient relation. So if we can orient one, uh, orientate one um, group color class, we can orientate the adjacent extension color class too, and likewise for the two others. This also works in the other direction. So we can give this one and this one an orientation too. Now, the first orientation we used, this was arbitrary. So if the first orientation would be the other way around, we would end up with orientations all in the other way around. But now, if you if look at this figure here, this process stops because all adjacent color classes now are already cyclic and we cannot uh, give some orientations to any other color classes anymore. I want to call an, uh, a set of color classes which 
uh, are connected in this way. So if we have, if we reflect in one color class, we have to reflect in all of them a reflection component. And the adjacent uh, cyclic color classes here in green, um, I want to call border color classes. So let's investigate this figure a bit further. Here is another a reflection component with a new border color class. Here's a singleton reflection component. And here on the right, the fourth starts. Yeah, with another reflection component, uh, another border color class. So, so we see how our uh, structure decomposes into reflection components, border color classes, and some other cyclic groups here, the white ones, which, which are not connected to a reflection component. And now let's try to use this for canonization. And first, just assume we only have one reflection component D, and now the regular uh, six gone denotes the whole reflection component embedded into this green cloud, it's, it's border color classes. Yeah, we have seen just before that if we orientate one color class, we can orientate all of them. So we can define two orientations of D, yeah, by orienting the first color class to the left or to the right. And because choiceless polynomial time is choiceless, we cannot choose one of these orientations, but we have to define both of them. But now these are abelian structures because all color classes are, uh, have an orientation and are cyclic groups. So we can apply the canonization procedure for abelian color classes to get two canonical copies of them, one for each orientation. But canonical copies, they are totally ordered. So we can in particular compare them lexicographically. And now just let's assume that the um, copy above is smaller or equal to uh, the one below. Then we, can, then we can turn this into a canonical copy of the reflection component we started, it, we started with just by throwing the arrows away again. And this we can also do in choices polynomial time. So if we only have one reflection component, we can in that way obtain a canonical copy for it together with its border color classes. And then we will be interested in, in, on the next slide on the set of canonical labelings which are the isomorphisms from the orientation uh, from the reflection component D to its canonical copy. Okay, we have seen how we can uh, canonize one reflection component. Now let's try to puzzle this together into a canonization procedure for structures with dihedral colors. So seen here on the left, there's our structure H. And the first thing what we do is we define the reflection components, which we can do in CPT. Then we consider only the abelian part of the structure, so all non dihedral color classes, and canonize them using uh, the canonization procedure for abelian colors. Yeah, then we also define the canonical labelings between the abelian part and its um, canonical, canonical copy and start to process the um, reflection components one by one. So in the figure, just assume we also have canonized three reflection components and filled in the holes in the canonical copy. And we are now in uh, to canonize the fourth one. And we just do it as on the slide before. We first define the two orientations. We then canonize them and we just not canonize them in some way, but we canonize them such that there's, their canonization is compatible with what we have already done. So we want to ensure that the canonical labelings of the reflection component D4 and the canonical labelings of the abelian part, which we already have canonized, is uh, non-empty. Then we compare the canonical copies. If one uh, happens to be uh, smaller than the other, we adjust this to our uh, canon and update the canonical labelings. Or if they are equal, we just add both and update the canonical labelings too. Then we do this until we have done all uh, uh, reflection components and end up with the canonical copy of our structure. So at some point here, I lied to you, and these are the canonical labelings. We cannot define the canonical labelings easily in choice as polynomial time, because this can be exponentially many. Yeah, in, in the uh, procedure for abelian colors, they are um, encoded by a certain class of linear equation systems called cyclic equation systems which we have to generalize to suit the dihedral case, and we call them tree-like cyclic equation systems. 
but with them uh, we can manage to canonize um, dihedral uh, structures as I've showed you here. So to wrap up, um, we prove that dihedral graphs and ternary odd dihedral structures can be canonized in choiceless polynomial time. And in particular, choiceless polynomial time captures P time on these class of structures. Therefore, we use this uh, normal form for structures from which we hope that they can be useful more generally. Um, we have to classify injective products of uh, dihedral groups. We have to uh, decompose our structure into reflection components. And we needed this tree-like cyclic equation systems I have not presented in this talk. Yeah, in that way, we show how we can bring more group theory into logics. And this is the point where I want to conclude my talk. Yeah, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Moritz. Um, okay, so there is a question from Bruno Dinis, who I am just asking to unmute. No, I, was, I don't have a question. I was just clapping. Oh, oh I see. Oh, okay, sorry. That was a clapping, not a hand raising. Sorry about that. Does anybody have a question? There were, I mistook the clapping for, for a hand raising. The symbol is actually a little bit different, I now realize. Do, does anybody have a question? Please, please raise your hand. Um, okay, so once again, I have, I'd just like a very, uh, to ask a very, very high level question, which is, you started off talking about a, a logic for polynomial time. So uh, in what way are we now closer to a logic for polynomial time? Um, we are closer in the way that we are, if we take um, canonization for bounded color class size, which means capturing polynomial time on these structures, as a first step, we are now a step f uh, closer to this uh, first step. And we 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 seen how complicated things come, and how we could eventually generalize this to to other class of groups like uh, odd or odd groups or something like this. Okay, well, thank you for the explanation. Um, so, are there any other questions? Well. Uh, yeah, there's one one from Eric Gradle. This really is a raised hand, so I shall ask Eric to unmute. Uh. Okay, I mean, it's not really a question, but it's a, a comment to your question. I mean, I would say uh, we get we don't really get closer to a logic for polynomial time, but we identify more and more classes of structures where we can actually capture polynomial time. I think the general conjecture is still that actually there is no logic for polynomial time uh, in general, uh, but we would like to understand on which classes of structure it's really possible to capture polynomial right. time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Advantages. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, okay, good. Any other questions? Right, so in that case, let me thank both speakers again, so Moritz and Samson, and once again, encourage you, we're now going into the, the first session break, so encourage you to all go to the gather social space. And if you would like to talk to the speakers there, try to find them at the speaker's corner. Otherwise, go and bump into each other and, uh, and uh, um, I'm afraid coffee and croissants and things like that, you have to provide for yourselves. Um, but anyway, have a nice break and we start again 